We have my former manager on the line, former Texas Rangers manager, and my former manager, Bobby Valentine. Bobby V, how you doing? Much, much more important, Michael, that I was your major league manager. Forget about the Rangers. Well, you no one out there roots for the Rangers anymore. <laughs> oh. They're all Mike Bassick fans. What oh, are you kidding? Fact. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> well, thank you, Bobby. And for <laughs> my family, they are Mike Bassick fans. For everybody else, like, you played Major League Baseball? And I'm like, yes, I did. <laughs> I played Major League Baseball. Bobby, we have so much to talk about. I want to yeah, ask... Your my best, Mike. Let's go for it. Okay, yeah. so when you took over managing the Rangers, they were in somewhat of a rebuilding situation. And then in, I'm going to go with 1989. You guys get Julio Franco. You get Nolan Ryan. And... For Chris Woodward, he's been in baseball, played, coached just like you, and he took over a managerial job where it was more of younger players. And now he gets Marcus Simeon. He gets, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, Seager from the Dodgers. What is it like being a manager, getting superstar players on on your team, and and kind of that adjustment maybe a manager has to make to getting big-time, highly paid players? Well, you know, you set up your... um apostles within your group over the years and uh when you get new guys that come in and they already have spread the word uh of somebody else's gospel if you will uh you got to make sure that those veterans get on board as quickly as possible because you want them to be reciting uh your messages in the clubhouse if that makes any sense to you. That makes 100% sense to yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, and so it, 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 it's, a, it's a challenge, you know? It's really a challenge. It's like I remember, uh, Michael, you remember when we got Pete Incavea out of Oklahoma State where he was the Golden Spikes winner in the United States and a number one draft choice, and he had a hitting coach up there that, uh, you know, he hit with, where he hit uh, a thousand home runs in six in six weeks of play or whatever it was to get the golden spikes. Well, for him to cut the cord from what he had learned in college and learn the new vernacular of Tom Robson and Bobby Valentine so that he could spread the word of hitting, uh, it was really difficult, really difficult. Talking with Bobby Valentine right here on 105 Through the Fan. Now, I know this doesn't directly involve you, but I would love your insight on this. Is the situation happening in the NFL where a former coach, Brian Flores, is saying that he was told by the owner to actively lose games? I'm curious if either directly or indirectly you think that that happens at all in baseball where you're either flat out told or encouraged to maybe not have the best season. Well, I was wondering how many of those losses I could actually say I was told to lose, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean, since that story came out, I said, geez, there's, there's something here for me, I think. Uh, but uh, I, I can't imagine. Uh, there was one meeting. I'll, I'll be very, very uh, candid with you. There was one meeting uh, where we had, you know, George W. had his group in, and they were a spectacular group of all uh, very wealthy and, and um, well-thought uh, people. And um, one of the members, when we were talking about uh, putting uh, real seats into the bleachers, if you remember the old Arlington yes. Stadium had uh, just those bleacher seats. You know, got they got hotter than hell. We were talking about, hey, we'll put more seats in that we could charge more. And uh, his take on it was that there was a break-even point with the number of people who come to the stadium uh, where the money drops down to the bottom line. And he didn't think it was a good idea to get either more people in or even have them sit in be- better seats. So, yeah, that's as close to not uh, doing my best or not doing our best that I ever came came across. Bobby, I I've been very adamant that that the the guys like Barry Bonds, uh, guys like Roger Clemens, they are a they are even a very important part of the story of that era of baseball. And I don't like that they didn't get into the Hall of Fame. I wanted to get your take because you coached 
against them. You coach with them. You like like what were your thoughts on those guys and how deserving they were for that spot? Yeah, you know, those guys and the guy who's closer to my heart, and that's Rafael Palmeiro. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, when you when you think about how good these people were, and if you just talk about the two you mentioned, I mean, seven Cy Youngs, and, and it could have been ten MVPs uh, between the two of these guys. They're the best pitcher and the best hitter that I, you know, ever, ever saw firsthand. And to think that the best of the best, isn't they're not in the Hall of Fame because of some, um, you know, situation that we were trying to clear our name, and so we'll go after the big guys and we'll and everything will be better, and we'll make it seem like uh, you know there, there's there's never been a problem. Well, that that wasn't the cure for that ill, I don't believe, and I think they should be in the Hall of Fame without a doubt. So, Bobby, I know you have a book that's just came out called Valentine's Way, and I was reading it uh, last night, Uh-oh. the introduction, <laughs> and, and uh, reading a little bit of the first chapter where, um, you know, your mother was working a lot and, and uh, this and that. And I'm wondering, because I didn't get fr- far into the book, when you talk about Roger Clemens, I wasn't there at the time when there was the Roger Clemens, Mike Piazza issue. In the book, do you talk about that? And and if not, can you give us a story on why Roger seemed to somewhat go after Mike Piazza? Well, that is in the book. Actually, Mike uh, wore him out. It was it was uh, it was simple stuff, you know. Roger was spectacular, and uh, you know, Mike was a little um, had had that little spot inside. You know what I mean, Michael? Yeah. I mean, a little a ball off the plate. If he swung at it, the bat would break in half. You know, and and Roger was frustrated in the fact that he couldn't get the ball there where Mike would swing. Mike would just lift up his arms and it'd become a ball and he'd get behind in the count and Mike Roger would go away and Mike would tattoo him. And I mean he he hit some of the hardest balls off of Roger of anybody that Roger ever pitched to. And uh, you know, he finally decided he was gonna definitely get one inside. Uh, I think he elevated it more than he wanted to. He was thinking about throwing it in the middle of his back. Um, but, you know, when you talk about Roger, because this is t- a 214 area code, and you guys, one of the coolest nights ever back in the old stadium was when Roger came in and hooked up against Nolan Ryan. Mm-hmm. It was it was the battle of big techs against the battle of future mechs, you know, and, and tech mechs. And um, Roger had a lead going into the last inning, and I sent up Gino Petrolli. Yes. Now, you got to remember Gino Petrolli, the year before, was driving a Dr. Pepper truck, delivering oh. Dr. Pepper uh, uh, to, to the community when our third-string catcher at AAA got hurt. Gino had been a Toronto uh, player he was released he's now selling dr pepper we don't have a catcher backing up at triple a he gets signed i go up to watch a triple a team he has a good good game and the next week he's in the big leagues i mean he has an, a remarkable story uh himself but anyway he, he goes up to pitch in and he hit the ball down the right field line a 96 mile hour fastball and stayed fair and tied the game and you know, it's a great. It was one of the greatest moments in his life. Obviously, it was a great moment for me. And Roger spoiled the day by saying, "Oh, I just threw it where he was swinging." And oh. you know, part of part of that, Roger, is the reason he's not in. Not only the the idea of what he might have, uh, you know, did to help stimulate his performance or enhance his performance. But his attitude, as well as Barry's, are as, as much a reason that they're not in the in the hall, and that's as much a reason that uh, it shouldn't be uh, that that moral clause should not even be in there when they're talking about who should get in, because half of the guys that are not half of the guys, but there's a lot of guys in there who had some warts when they went into the Hall of Fame. Let's let's face it. Mm-hmm. Talk with Bobby Valentine right here on 105 through the fan. Now we're having so many people who are enjoying this conversation. I was hoping that you could take us back and re- regale us with any thoughts from that 1986 season because when I was really coming into my own as a Rangers fan, they started to get back in the mix. They made the playoffs eventually in 96, but for the longest time, this franchise was not necessarily the place to be 
And then in 86, you made a run at the division title and like kind of sparked the area. What was that season like? Oh, it, it was magical. It was cool. You know, uh, Tom Grieve was uh, at the at the helm, who's the most spectacular person who's ever lived and one of the great baseball minds. you got to remember, I got there in 85. There was already a sabermetrician on the staff. Huh? Mm. We had Craig Wright in 1986 full time doing analytics for the for the organization. We had uh, the one of the first weight rooms, if not the first real weight room in all of Major League Baseball, that was put in. And we didn't have an advanced scout because my owner gave me the choice. Eddie Childs, whole Eddie Childs. He gave me a choice of either having a satellite dish where I could record other games of other teams being played or an advanced scout, and I took the satellite dish, okay? <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, this is, this is like crazy. I hired Tom House, who had our pitchers throwing footballs in the outfield. People were, weren't thinking, hey, let's go to the baseball game. It was like, hey, let's go see what, what the hell these mad scientists are doing out in Arlington Park. I hear it's different than it was. And, you know, things that sell in life are, are when you're first, when you're the best, or when you're different. And what we wanted to be, because we couldn't be the first at anything, we wanted to be a little different, and then we wanted to be the best. And, uh, you know, if we had playoffs in those, those days, it would have been a real different situation, you know, where you have a wild card or you have more than one team from a division get in. Uh, but we were up against Oakland and Minnesota, you know, and uh, they were just flat out a little better than us. Bobby, as one but of those, but eighty six, yes, no, eighty six. Let me say, we we signed, we we trade for Pete Incavilla. Never been done before in the history of the game. A guy who is not signed by a team, only drafted by a team. That was the Montreal Expos. Got to trade him to a major league team. There's now a rule called the Incavilla rule that doesn't allow a team to do that anymore. You know, we had um, uh, Bobby Witt, a fireballer, Mitch Williams, a wild left-hander. You know, <coughs> we had these things that people could kind of start to imagine in their minds that, that Ruben Sierra really is Roberto Clemente, and that's why he's wearing 21 and playing right field, and he's from Puerto Rico, you know, uh, that uh, – the, the, the homegrown Pete O'Brien and, and Steve Bouchelle, who's then coming up to replace Buddy Bell, uh, are these guys that you can latch on to and grow with. So it was all a magical experience that uh, I think the fans of, of uh, the Texas Rangers really enjoyed. Did you did you ever have to console Steve Bouchel and tell him they're not booing you? They're just saying your <laughs> last name? Because as one of those kids, I was asking my grandpa, why are they booing Steve Bouchel? Isn't that something? No, Steve. Steve was one of my favorites. Uh, I hate to say that I had favorites. Mike was one of my favorites. Steve was one of my favorites. Uh, and and um, you know he came up, uh, had to fill the big shoes of the captain, Buddy Bell, and did a spectacular job. And uh, regretfully, we made we we traded him to the to the Pirates. And uh, um, you know, look, and he came back, so that was cool too that he he became a coach and and gave some more of his years to the to the Rangers. Bobby, and I'll always appreciate one time you had to take me out of the rotation at the end of 2002, and, and you took me back to the hotel and explained me explained to me why that you know you had to do that. And that meant a lot to me because usually, I don't know this, but in my time with different managers, they never really did that. They just said, hey, you're out of the rotation or we're sending you down, but you gave me an explanation why. So that meant a lot to me back then. Well, thanks for remembering, and, uh, you know, it was, um, you know, like yesterday that uh, we were we were in that cab, and you you were pitching on that staff, and that was a, you know, crazy year for me, obviously, but um, when, when I was a young man, a young player, I played for Tommy Lasorda, and Tommy Lasorda is that guy that everyone thinks of as the flamboyant speaker, after dinner speaker, joke teller friend of Frank, Frank Sinatra, et cetera, et cetera. But he was a spectacular baseball man. And what he brought to the major leagues when he came up in 1977 was this idea that it's not my way or, or the highway. 
It's not the military structure that we're going to model ourselves after in a baseball team. He got to know the, the families, the, the kids' names, the, the, the reason people were frowning other than the strikeout that, that they might make. And uh, I love that style. I never really had that style again in my career except for a year with Joe Torre, a year and a half with Joe Torre. He was trying to figure it out if he could do that and be that type of manager when I played for him with the Mets. But that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to make it more than, hey, man, you, you hung a curveball and you cost us the game. It, it's a little more like how's your grandmother and uh, did the kids get a full night's sleep last night? And, uh, you know, the, 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 the way you coach people outside the lines, I thought was more important than the way you coach them inside the lines. The book so is- thanks for the book is Valentine's Way, My Adventurous Life and Times. If you want to get even more of this amazingness, Bobby, thank you so much for jumping on with us. Oh, are you kidding me? Thank you, guys. And uh, if you're ever up in uh, the, the Northeast, I have a baseball academy, a restaurant. My name's all over the place. I'm easy to find. So come and, come and see me. I was hoping to call you Mayor Valentine. <laughs> it, it was really oh, close, Bobby. Yeah. Came up short. I came up a little short there. Got a little complacent at the end. I should should have known better. But uh, yeah, I, I lost uh, the mayor's race and got four years of my life back. Think about that. <laughs> <laughs>